having me here, for inviting me. I'm very honored to be able to present. And I took a sort of a different approach than the previous presenters in the sense that I'm not going to present a specific paper or a specific uh, ongoing research project. Who has time for that anyway? But I want to give you sort of an overview of what I believe that are the things that we know and that we need to know after doing a decade of research uh, on the issue of uh, child care inequality. So this will be more of a personal assessment of what I think are the main questions for the future and the main things that we need to focus on. But of course, it's a personal assessment, so I might very well, and I'm pretty sure I will overlook some other important issues, so I'm very happy to hear your thoughts and insights and comments on this as well. And to uh, foreshadow my talk a little bit, I, I think it clearly links with the previous talks during this seminar. And I also kind of hope, and I haven't talked to him about this, but I also hope that my talk kind of will feed in nicely into Lance's keynote uh, lecture later this evening. And of course, I also draw heavily on the insight from the Handbook of Family Policy I edited with Renze. And yes, I seize every opportunity I have to advertise the handbook. Uh, thousands of satisfied readers have preceded you. So please download the book. It's open access. Don't buy it. <laughs> please don't buy the book. Download it. It's open access and available for everyone. And many of the things I'll be talking about will be of are covered in this handbook as well. So. In terms of a, of a starting point, and this is basically the starting point uh, that inspired my PhD research back in the day. So the idea that social investment policy ideas are dominant, certainly so in European policy circles, but also and predominantly in academic circles, social investment or the social investment idea has become, it became very dominant uh, to guide social policy change and social policy reform across European countries and also beyond that, even at the sort of a global uh, scale. Uh, social investment is all about social policies should be geared away from, you know, repairing the problem afterwards, from ex post interventions to ex ante interventions, sort of preparing, empowering people to be able to participate in today's labor markets. And the provision of uh, high quality childcare is one of the cornerstones of such strategy. For two, main, for two basic reasons, for two main reasons. The first reason is what I call an employment effect because of course the availability of childcare allows for two ownership, in case of course there are two adults in the household, allows parents to work to outsource uh, the care that they have for their children. And this should have a sort of an immediate uh, employment effect, uh, raising family incomes uh, and helping families in the very short term. There's also a, uh, a second reason, which is, you know, which I refer to as a development effect. And perhaps this is even a more important reason, right? Because it's a more long term effect. It's a high quality childcare is, is good, is beneficial for child development, both in non-cognitive and, cogn and, and cognitive development. Uh, it improves school readiness, and in the long term, it allows children to basically do better in primary school, in secondary school, to attain a diploma, and then, of course, in the very long run, be able to take a better place or attain a better place in today's labor markets. And of course, this should be in particular beneficial for disadvantaged children, for children living in poverty, for instance, because they often live in households in which the parents don't work or only have scattered employment patterns or employment arrangements. And they also stand to gain the most from this development effect. So in that sense, childcare is within that paradigm of social investment is really regarded as a very inefficient way actually to combat poverty and to reduce social inequalities over time you know and the expectations are quite high so it's been called the greatest of all equalizers for instance i mean the greatest of equalizers even greater an equalizer than existing social security systems for instance and you know this kind of setup this this kind of paradigm inspired me to dig a bit deeper into this question so how and in what sense would, would child care actually be helpful to reduce these inequalities both in the short term 
and in the longer term. And that's basically what I will try to, what I will be trying to focus on in this presentation. And so let me start off first with the question, what do we know? What do we know? What can we already say about the issue of childcare inequality? And let me first provide you with a sort of a bird's eye view of how the European uh, landscape of childcare has changed over time. What you see here on this graph is spending on, on childcare services in 2005 expressed as a percentage of GDP on the horizontal axis and the same thing spending on childcare services but then in 2015 so a decade later and basically what you see is that the majority of countries are above the diagonal which means you know that spending on childcare has increased in almost all of European countries, right? The sole exceptions are Slovenia, uh, the United Kingdom, and Denmark here. But of course, Denmark was already at a very, very high level of spending. And for instance, if you look at countries like Germany, and but also Luxembourg is actually an interesting example. You see you know, that spending in Germany has risen from 0.4% of GDP to 0.6%. GDP in 2015. The same thing in Belgium, but then, interestingly enough, we see that the countries who were already big spenders in terms of childcare services tended to increase their spending even more, right? So we see big increases in Norway, Iceland, and Sweden, for instance. So spending on childcare services has clearly increased. Governments started to invest more and sometimes much more in childcare over time. And this has also translated in, into increased enrollment rates to increased participation of young children in childcare services. So what you see here is childcare service use, the use of formal childcare services amongst the youngest children aged zero to three years old. And these are full-time equivalents to take into account differences in the intensity of use. And again, we see the same, so we see the same pattern here at the horizontal axis our enrollment rates, so childcare use in 2005, and we see the same thing, enrollment rates in 2015 on the vertical axis. And again, we see that for the majority of countries, you know, enrollment has actually increased and sometimes increased very strongly, very substantially. Basically, again, some exceptions, the UK again, and also Slovak Republic and Lithuania basically shows a stable pattern, but in countries like Germany and Luxembourg, again, we see huge increases in the enrollment rates in the actual participation of young children, which kind of squares, of course, with what we've seen in the previous presentation on the German case. You also see the same thing happening in Norway, in Sweden, uh, we see clear increases. In the Netherlands, we see clear increases. So again, the dominant picture here is that spending has increased in the majority of European countries. Governments started to invest more, sometimes much more in childcare. And this has translated also in higher childcare participation rates over time. Now, let us then take a look at uh, inequality in child carriers. What you see here on this graph are inequality ratios. So the ratio of, the, of inequality of mean child care use amongst children under three living in the highest income households, so based on the highest income quintile, uh, to the mean child care use amongst children living in the lowest income households. Right? And again, 2005 and 2015. And so what you see is a basically a picture of quite substantial inequalities across European countries. So for instance, in Ireland in 2005, higher income or children living in high income households were 13 times as likely to use childcare than children living in low income households. For Poland, 11 times as likely. For the UK, seven times as likely. Portugal, five times as likely. France, three times as likely and so on and so forth. And basically, only countries here, Iceland, Denmark, Slovenia, Estonia, and also Slovak Republic in 2005, showed sort of more or less equal patterns by household income patterns of uh, childcare use. So, you know, these, these inequality ratios, these translate in sometimes really, really substantial inequalities. For instance, in the UK, uh, in 2005, this means that basically 6% of, of young children in the lowest income groups actually were enrolled in childcare services versus 45% in 
in the highest income groups. For France, for instance, 21% versus 69%. Norway, with only a bit of small inequality ratio of two, but still means that, of course, that high-income children are two times as likely uh, than low-income children to be enrolled in childcare. So this translates into usage patterns of 31% at the lowest income quintile versus 64% in the highest income quintile. If we then look 10 years later, and in 2015, we see that inequalities in some countries have, have actually increased. And again, UK is a good example of this. Inequalities really, really increased in the UK. Same holds for Lithuania, but also for France and Slovakia, for instance. For instance, in the UK, we see that, you know, participation in childcare has reduced, uh, has decreased for all children, but more so for low-income children. Now the ratio is 11, which translates into usage pattern of 3% for the lowest income households versus 36% in the highest income households. For France, it means 17% for the lowest incomes versus 77% for the highest incomes. And for Norway, there we see the op opposite pattern. In Norway, inequalities have decreased, and we see that the increase in childcare use have mainly was mainly concentrated amongst the lowest income households. And basically the same we see in Germany. There we see the same pattern. And so, in general, we see that in terms of spending and in terms of childcare use, European countries tended to converge over time. In terms of inequality, we see that European countries tended to diverge. And this is quite established. And since if you look at this from using different indicators of social economic position, if you, if you calculate this for educational level of the mother, for instance, or if you use a social class indicator, or if you look at household income, basically the pattern is always the same thing. There are clear cleavages in terms of social economic position in terms of childcare use. And we see that over time, despite these increased investments, these increased levels of spending, increased participation rates that not all countries have actually succeeded in reducing these inequalities. And we also see more and more emerging evidence in a comparative way that there are also important ethnic cleavages in terms of childcare participation rates, that children living in migrant households in many European countries are actually disadvantaged on top of their social social economic position, that they are even less likely to be enrolled in formal childcare services, even if the parents are at work, for instance. So again, from a social investment perspective, this is quite problematic because, of course, if we want the social investment idea of childcare as an excellent instrument to reduce these inequalities early on, if we want to make sure that this comes true, then, of course, these, in particular, these disadvantaged children need to have access to these services. And I'm going to be very brief about this, but we see basically a similar pattern if we look at parental leave use. Also there, and this is based on data from the EU Labour Force uh, survey, the ad hoc modules in 2005 and 2010 on work and family life reconciliation. But if we look at, you know, which households have actually used parental leave for the youngest child, then again, we see in many countries uh, important inequalities in terms of social economic position in this graph calculated based on educational level. So if you look at, you know, from the cradle, basically, into the next system, into the use of leave, and then into the next system, the use of childcare services, we see these fast inequalities by socioeconomic uh, status, uh, by socioeconomic position in society. And this is, of course, my biggest concern is that this will translate also in these later stages of life in the educational system, in the labor market, and of course, reinforcing these patterns of disadvantage over the life cycle. And this is often referred to as a Matthew effect, right? The Matthew effect in early childcare, the Matthew effect referring to the sociological process of cumulative advantage, of cumulative disadvantage over time of over the life course, often originating in the lottery of birth. And there's a whole strand of research on this in sports and business in all sorts of different, different spheres of life where we time and again see these patterns of cumulative advantage, right? If you start from an advantage position, be it because you're born in a high income family or be it because you are lucky at some point in your life, this advantage tends to accumulate, accumulate over time, sort of widening the gap over time. And this is an issue um, that has been researched as well, or this is sort of a, a lens, a perspective to look at social 
reality that has been applied in family policy research as well, in social policy research in general as well. And there it is often, you know, there the analyses used to be very static, used to be looking at in these cross-sectional distributions, looking at the question who benefits from this government investment. But I think, you know, that this lens is also helpful in its original way, in its way of looking at at this process as a dynamic process, accumulating uh, advantage or disadvantage over time. Because if we look at the issue of childcare, for instance, from this point of view, then we clearly can make the argument that if we see these inequalities in childcare service use emerging early on in life, and mainly those children who are disadvantaged to begin with, who were born in disadvantaged households, and we know that high quality childcare is actually good for children, then we see that advantaged children born in circumstances that are, are already help them later in life also gain most of the benefits from these high quality childcare services, while those disadvantages, while, while those disadvantaged children who stand to gain the most from this are mostly excluded. And this, you know, can be or can we expect, will in the end widen that gap following that pattern of cumulative. Uh, advantage. And this would be actually the, the opposite of what is intended, of course, thinking about this from this uh, social investment idea. And I think, you know, this, this also sort of shows or demonstrates the importance of looking at this issue from a macro sociological perspective. But because most of the research, and uh, certainly so in the previous decades, on childcare, on the, the impact of childcare on inequalities, was focused on these very often small scale projects in which disadvantaged children were included in a sort of a high quality childcare environment. And this was usually mainly from in, conducted in a US background. But of course, this is not helpful. So you can infer from this that high quality childcare, if disadvantaged children participate in these high quality childcare projects, that this indeed helps them to bridge the gap with the more advantaged peers. But this is not helpful to think about inequalities accumulating over time or inequalities, you know, from a more country level or a more macro perspective, because this is not helpful if none of these disadvantaged children actually have access to these services, right? So that's why you need to take a step back, I think, and in the first place, have a look at the big picture, at the aggregating numbers at the country level. So, but I think we need to know more. This is also sort of a self-critique, right? Because I mainly have conducted the research from this cross-sectional perspective, more of a static perspective, looking at the distribution, looking at the question who actually benefits, who actually uses, and then inferred this process of cumulative advantage and disadvantage from this. But I think it's now time, it's now high time that we actually model this in a dynamic and a more longitudinal way, that we try to model this process of amplification over time and to examine what circumstances and policies might actually mitigate this mature effect over time. And do we actually see what we expect to see when we take the observation of the mature effect seriously? And I also would like to refer you to a recent exchange we had in the Journal of European Social Policy on this, on the social investment strategy, on how to measure mature effects on, you know, the short term versus the long term effects of this. And I think that was a really helpful exchange we had that actually helps us to think more clearly about these issues and think more clearly about you know, the fundamental questions that we need to tackle in the future. Okay, moving on, I would like to show you some results as well, also, or again, from this macro perspective, on some questions that we try to tackle over time, some questions that I think uh, were important to tease out properly. And one of these questions was, what can we, or to what kind of context are these inequalities that we see across these different countries related? Is this related to supply side problems? Is this related to structural constraints in how policies work? Is this related to structural constraints in the availability or the affordability of childcare services? So is it an issue of supply? Is it a pro problem of supply? Or, and slash or, is it a problem or an issue that is related to the demand side of the equation? Is it related to the preferences of families with children? Because, and that is of course also related to one of the presentations we had in this session already, these preferences, that idea that preferences and norms are sort of in a reciprocal relationship, mutually reinforcing each other, right? So norms and pre preferences shape policies, 
and the other way around. So we try to tease that out, but we try to tease it out in a way that is inadequate, uh, that I think, you know, learners a lot, but it was inadequate in the sense that we only, that we didn't really, or we still don't really have good indicators to measure these questions properly, to measure the supply side of the equation and to measure the demand side of the equation. And so we tried to come up with proxies. So we looked at labor force survey data to look at this from a European comparative perspective, looked at, you know, the inequalities in childcare use that we observe, and then try to relate this to, on the one hand, the share of respondents that actually indicate, I cannot work or cannot work more because of problems in the availability or the affordability of childcare services, right? And we aggregated this at the country level and we regarded this as a sort of a, an indication that this is a context in which there are supply side problems. If a high share of people actually indicate, well, I want to work more, but I can't because of availability, affordability issues, we regard this as, you know, this is a supply side issue. here. And for the demand side, we also aggregated the, the share of respondents who adhere to more traditional norms on motherhood. And there we did the same thing. We regarded the high share of respondents saying, well, it hurts a child when the mother goes to work when the child is young. Then we regard this as a context in which childcare use is not really encouraged, right? In which if you use childcare, if you live in a two-owner family, you kind of deviate from the norm. And that dominant norm, of course, influences your individual decision. So we looked at these two parts, the supply side and the demand side of uh, the equation. And this is basically what we found. Um, I'm not going to go in too much detail looking at the time, but basically what you see here is if you look at the demand side of the equation, then you basically see that childcare use decreases when norms become more traditional. So in a context in which working, in which you know, uh, outsourcing care is not encouraged, Childcare use is lower overall. So there we see a clear relationship between the two. But we don't see much effect on the inequality between different social groups, societies, right? So basically the gap between high social classes and low social classes, so here we use the social class indicator, is basically, is basically of the same size and different levels or different shares of dominant norms. This is different when we look at the proportion of respondents indicating structural constraints. We clearly see that the gap closes, that the gap in inequality use closes in a context where few respondents actually indicate, well, we don't have problems or we face these affordability or availability problems in childcare provision. But we clearly see that the gap increases in a context where, you know, supply side problems are more important. So, but, you know, the conclusion sort of is that in countries where the dominant norm is more against maternal employment, then we see that childcare service use tends to be lower overall. But we see, we also conclude that dominant norms that these, you know, this demand side of the equation at the country level uh, do not explain inequality in childcare use, but that structural constraints are actually a good or a much better predictor of inequality in childcare use. And indeed, we know from specific country studies and from case uh, studies that if childcare places are rationed and expensive, then we see that the lowest incomes are disproportionately affected by this. And of course, this, this has many reasons. And this is also one of the things that has already been discussed in the first presentation in the seminar by Mara, that, you know, these are very complex issues and people take these decisions you know, given the context in which they live in their family, but also in the kind of service or in the context and in the kind of local or neighborhood context and the availability, for instance, of the childcare places is really important here. And of course, you know, we also see that people use their social and cultural capital and their financial resources to secure a place in case places are rationed. But in most European countries, places are rationed. There is a shortage in the number of places available. I had a new baby and, and, you know, the first thing that I did, I mean, okay, not necessarily the very first thing that I did, but, you know, one of the first things that I did was to pick up the phone and try to secure it in childcare because we, we had a direct need for a place in childcare. We have the resources and I know who to call and how these procedures work. So, but, you know, if you are not in that, you know, if you're from a more vulnerable 
socioeconomic position, if you don't speak the language properly, for instance, and you are faced with these constraints and you don't have this direct need because you're not employed at that particular moment, once you have that need, because for instance, you need, you are expected to participate in a training program, for instance, once you have that need, there is no place anymore for you, right? And so in case of shortages, disadvantaged families will be affected disproportionately. And so, but of course, you know, so it's such a macro indicator on supply doesn't really help us sort of disentangling what, what is now the policy aspect that is really important here. What, what is now, what can we learn about specific sets of policies or specific combinations of policies? And here too, we did some research trying to disentangle sort of plausible associations between childcare inequality and a different set of policy indicators. But again, this is not sufficient because, you know, we, we really lack indicators that sort of reflect properly the complexity of the issue of childcare policies. So what we used here is basically uh, maximizing uh, what's possible with the existing uh, indicators often drawn from the OECD family database, for instance, or from previous research projects. And what we see basically is that drawn on these indicators at that very macro level, right? So it's a very bird's eye view perspective that, you know, in countries where there is a more public supply or more subsidized supply, inequalities tend to be lower. Right? In countries in which there is a legal entitlement to childcare, inequalities tend to be lower. We, there's some evidence, but you know, it's, it's not very strong that when out-of-pocket fees are higher, so when the costs are higher, then inequalities are higher as well. This, of course, makes sense. But from a macro perspective, it's really difficult to tease this out because we lack a proper or we lack good indicators that actually measure what costs families actually face when they are looking for a suitable place in childcare. Uh, we also see interaction effects with, for instance, the paid leave system, right? In countries where there are long and well-paid leaves, inequalities are bigger because inequalities in leave taking and inequalities in labor market will be more important there in these countries as well. So we we kind of are able to, to have a, a somewhat better grasp of some policy elements of the mix, but we really lack the sort of information that we need to, to inform better policies. And finally, you know, there's increasing literature looking at, at, at these regional and local inequalities. And I will be very brief about this because we already had some presentations about this and there will be some presentations, if I'm not mistaken, tomorrow as well. But we really see that in, indeed these local policies, for instance, as Mara indicated, or these regional policies uh, are really, really important. And it's that mix, that combination of federal or national, regional and local policies that actually, you know, determine what is really available for parents when they are in need of a place in childcare. For instance, in Flanders, we did some research in which we showed that the mechanisms at the central government level to distribute subsidies for new places basically just followed increasing employment rates of women. Basically meaning that the newly created places were mainly created in neighborhoods full of two earner families and not in the neighborhoods where unemployed families are usually, usually clustered and where the need, of course, where those disadvantaged children are clustered as well, are concentrated as well. So because of a sort of an automated uh, subsidizing system and the rules within that system, you know, newly created places basically contributed to increasing inequalities at the regional level. So these complex mechanisms are really, really important to understand this Matthew effect in child care use. So very briefly now, the story this far for me in my personal perspective, right, is we clearly see these inequalities between families by socioeconomic status, by ethnicity. We see clear inequalities between countries and we see clear inequality between neighborhoods within countries. So inequalities at these different uh, levels. And I think we have strong evidence on inequalities in childcare participation and how this changed over time, right? So Basically, uh, there are other papers trying to use other data to, to tackle these questions. Time and again, we see the same pattern. These inequalities are there. We also have strong evidence, I would say, on the role of socioeconomic status at the micro level and employment. For instance, in some of the papers, we show that socioeconomic status is, of course, an important predictor of these inequalities, that employment does 
explain a bit of the gap that we see between different uh, social groups, but not uh, the full gap. And that even for people who are working, there are social class effects, for instance. So I think we have pretty good evidence on this. We also have some good evidence on the role of social spending on childcare service. We see spending more, you know, leads to more places, spending more leads to higher enrollment rates, and spending more can lead to reduced inequalities if and only if, of course, these new places are available at uh, for the whole income distribution. And I think we also have some of a good notion or, you know, of the general patterns related to these macro indicators of supply and demand. We have emerging evidence on any cleavages and child care use. And I think we also have some good hypotheses on the role of public versus market driven supply, right? For instance, in one of the papers in which we looked at social spending over time, we kind of showed that we kind of, or the evidence suggests that spending more spending in a market-driven context is not really helpful to mitigate these inequalities, for instance, while it is helpful to mitigate inequalities more in a publicly provided context. And so to finish my talk, what do we need to know? What do we need to do as researchers, as academics in the future? I think we need more research. And I mean, I'm, I'm, this, this is an open door, of course, but we need more research. That's what we do. That's what we want to do. That's what we want money for. We need to do, we need to do more research, more research into the role of policies. And there is a dire need for comparable indicators of childcare policies. And this is, of course, my link at least that's what I hope, with uh, Rens' keynote as well. And this is a very, very complex issue, and we have already been talking about this, and we will talk about it, so I will be very brief, but I listed some of the issues, some of the complexities that we need to take into account when we think about policies. But this is important because I think that our research should strive to inform better policymaking, right? And if we just say, well, what I have done many times before, you know, these inequalities are a problem. We need to solve them. We need to do something about this. Yeah, but what do we need to do? Well, you need to spend more. How do we need to spend more? Well, we need to make sure that spending benefits everyone across the income distribution. Yeah, but how exactly? Well, that's a good question. And we don't really know at this point, or we have some evidence at the local level or from case studies and so on, but we don't, we miss that sort of comprehensive picture. But this is difficult because of all of these complexities in terms of the different nitty gritty details that are involved in childcare policy making. And, you know, so for profit versus not for profit, public versus private supply side, demand side issues, these are all important regulations at the different levels, regional variations, local variations, the fee structure how service providers are subsidized, uh, how parents are subsidized, how the tax system works with this. An important issue, I think, that we should start to explore more are these interactions with the different institutions uh, that precede and, and come after childcare service use. And the problem is, of course, almost all countries have a mixture of these, uh, these different options, but the balance difference. There's hardly a country that has solely one element of this mix. For instance, in Belgium, for instance, we really have this mix of publicly and privately provided childcare places. There is a not-for-profit, there's a majority of not-for-profit providers, but also an increasing number of for-profit providers. There's usually supply-side uh, subsidizing, but increasingly so also through the tax system directly uh, funding parents. Uh, there's regulation at different levels. Uh, there's fee structures. There are different fee structures at play, depending on what kind of service provider you are actually enrolled in. So all of these complexities are really important. Second thing, we need to have more research into the role of preference. And then in particular, on how individual attitudes towards the labor market, towards employment, but also towards, you know, child care in relation to the context, in relation to dominant norms, but also in relation, for instance, to child care supply, how these determine individual decisions to use child care or um, not. And I think this is important because, and this is also an issue of theory in terms of, you know, the, the social investment ID, for instance, there's basically no room there for the ID that people might deliberately choose not to use childcare, that they want to take care of their own children, for instance. But how do we you know, include this in the way we think about investing early on in children? You know, this is quite, so we don't, we, we sort of lack the theoretical basis to actually include this. And there's also, again, here, the complex 
relationship with structural problems and the way we measure these. I'll give you one example. Uh, there is an ad hoc module in 2016 included in the EU SIL database, which many of us, I think, hailed as very good because it tried to tease out, you know, the, the structural problems, these problems in the supply. But, you know, the, the questions were phrased in such a way that this was not really helpful for us. For instance, there was one question on unmet needs for formal childcare services. Do you have unmet needs? Yes or no? And then the, the, there was a follow-up question, which is more interesting, I think. What's the main reason for not making more use of childcare services? There are no places available. You cannot afford it. There's a spatial availability issues, for instance. So really, you know, trying to tackle these complex issue of policies. But this question was only asked for to the respondents indicating that they have an unmet need. But for instance, if you prefer to stay at home, then, then you don't have this unmet need. But of course, your preference to stay at home might also be influenced to, by the context in which it's very hard to secure a place in childcare. So these complex interactions between demand and supply, I think we have a lot of work ahead of us there. And this is uh, to close my uh, presentation. I think we need more research into the dynamics of these inequality and child care use. Do we indeed see the expectant patterns? And there we have a good theoretical basis in the form of the Matthew effect and the sociological observations there, that it is more about transitions over one's life course from birth into leave, into childcare, into education, into employment. And we really need sort of more longitudinal life course perspectives on this. And I would be really interested to, to have this data to actually follow up, does inequality in childcare use translate into the expected inequalities, into widening inequalities, for instance, in education. So to conclude, there's a lot of academic work to do, I think, with respect to inequalities in family policies, disentangling this complexity, causality issues, policy design, the dynamics of inequalities. I think there are limits to the comparative research design, and I have applied them many times, but you know, increasingly we, we sort of are stuck with this because of the indicates, because of the methods. And we, I think we should go, or we are going into the direction already of an increased focus on natural experiments, these actual policy changes that have taken place, exploiting these to these longitudinal studies, but also these in-depth case studies at different levels with a due focus on complexity and political economy issues. And of course, and it's easier said than done, <laughs> I fully realize this, but we, yeah, in terms of childcare research, we are in dire need of better data and better indicators. So thank you so much for listening and I'm looking forward to your questions and your ideas. Thank you so much. Music